the master classes on the food autobahn taking the express way to spectacular growth of your food service business and our distinguished speaker is mr ravi wazir who is an entrepreneurial hospitality and retail professional an author of restaurant startup a practical guide ravi has worked with various food companies which is swati snacks olive bar and kitchen cafe ritiza desi deli the tasty tangles the sports bar and the earthwell taj birdies he has authored articles to dna hindustan times express hospitality and hospitality business he has also authored a book restaurant startup a practical guide which is now in its second edition and is available on amazon and other online bookstores the session in which ravi will take us through a step by step doctrine on food service expansion strategy and the means and modes to grow intelligently and successfully how you can increase your restaurant business from 1 to 10 locations from 10 to 50 and 50 to 100 and so on thanks very much for that introduction and thank you all for being here i understand that amongst you uh, there are a lot of individual entrepreneurs who have a single restaurant and there are some amongst you who have a chain of restaurants already and would like to grow and some of you i believe are investors who would like to grow so i gave a lot of thought and tried to suss out from my experiences what i could say to all of you who are all very experienced yourselves that could help make a difference in your growth and i felt two things uh one is the attitude during growth which is quite different from the attitude during a startup and the other is what are the focus areas that you should look at during growth so i've put together a few thoughts and i might refer to my notes from time to time uh but i'd like to start off by saying that when uh, the india food forum uh sent me this title uh i liked it very much it said spectacular growth and it said autobahn and these two things i really liked because uh, spectacular growth says all of us are not satisfied with just ordinary growth it has to be spectacular everyone wants to come up with 50 outlets in 3 years and i've had every i'd say 99% of entrepreneurs and 100% of investors tell me this you know we've got this concept and we're going to start off 50 outlets in the next 3 years i say fantastic i'd love to learn because when i watch these investors and these entrepreneurs after those 3 years because i also like to watch the market i keep learning from all people all the time and when someone tells me they can do that it's amazing to me and i'd love to learn but it's very hard to really implement that and there are many obstacles along the way so what is it that we can do to achieve our goal i believe in india like most indians do particularly today we have a young demographic and we've got a stable government and i'm quite sure we can achieve that spectacular growth but i like to approach it with a little bit of caution and a little bit of thought which i'm going to share with you and the other part was the autobahn the express way which says i don't want to do it slowly i want to do this really fast i want to do this very fast because i want to compress my time time is indeed the greatest resource of any entrepreneur even more than money because if you can control your time and compress things within a certain amount of time your money will be taken care of because you will not bleed for that long if you do something quicker so i'd like to start off with a personal example uh in terms of uh sharing an experience that i had uh many years back and i'll tell you why i feel it's relevant to the discussion today 
Many years ago, I used to race motorcycles, 100cc bikes mainly, for a company called Sportscraft. They are a Mumbai-based company, and uh, I, I believe they still exist today. Just a couple of days back, I looked online, <clears throat> and they also have a website now. Uh, and uh, I, I often used to specialize in the uphill climb in, in racing. These uh, races used to happen at various tracks, including Film City, very often. And uh, they used to be sponsored by Castrol, the oil company. And there were two kinds of people who used to be a part of this racing circuit. One was automobile engineers, and the other was mechanics. And these guys understood these bikes very well. And they had just one agenda. And that agenda was to move their vehicle from point A to point B in the shortest possible time. So I liken our agenda today of moving our business from point A to point B in the shortest possible time, preferably with the least risk, but there are some risks you have to take. So I'll give you a couple of examples, and I'm sure you'll be able to relate to these very easily, but just to get started. Uh, the first thing is, uh, when you're racing, you have to strip the vehicle to the least weight. So you get rid of your headlights, you get rid of your side lights, you get rid of your tail lights, you even get rid of your engine guard. And I thought, that's a little weird. I mean, I need that for safety. I need to ride fast, but I need to be safe. And I learned the hard way why even that was necessary. Because when a biker in front of me once dropped his helmet and I took a curb, it was my engine guard which touched the helmet and dropped me to the ground. And by the time I got up, I missed that time completely. So what I thought was going to protect me actually harmed me. So how much do you cut your weight? We even used to remove fuel to the extent that was minimally required, fuel being money in our case. So use the minimum resources and stay lean. Now I'm talking about attitudes. There are two key things in this discussion which I'm hoping to share with you. One is attitudes during growth, and the other is a bunch of focus areas which I think we should look at. So this is the first attitude in terms of have an attitude of racing. But watch where you need to stay lean, how much you need to cut, what you think you're protecting yourself with, and what you need to just let go and take that risk. Another uh, one of the, I'll, I'll keep saying a couple of uh, examples and I'll, I'll correlate them to racing to start with. Uh, there's this interesting thing when you take an uphill climb, if you want to race when you're going uphill. An uphill is like a task in business, which we are doing, growing our business to multiple units. That's an uphill task. You need to reduce your air pressure in your front tires to lower than what is officially prescribed. And the reason for that is it will hug the road, it will grip the road. And that's particularly useful when you're going uphill and taking a curb. But that's not all. Your back wheels need to have higher air pressure than usual. And the reason for that is that gives you a bounce behind. So you've got your front tires gripping the road and your back tires bouncing while you're taking the curbs. And I liken that in business to a consumer connect. Because if you're not relevant in the market and you don't stay connected with the consumer, you're off. You're off the track. So keep a grip on the road and be flexible to move along with your market requirements. And another example that I'd like to give uh, is a strange one, uh, which is if a dog crosses the road in front of you, when you're racing, particularly on a bike, because in two wheels you can fall off much easier than when you have four wheels. Uh, and I'm sure there are, there are animal lovers here, and I am as well, I, I promise you. 
so what I'm going to say, please don't be offended. But if you see a dog in front of you and you know that you can't avoid that dog, then you must grip your handlebars completely strongly and hit that dog head on. You might go in a tizzy for a bit, but you'll get a grip eventually and you will be able to stand and continue without losing momentum, time, or damaging yourself. So, there are many, many more examples, but at a more basic level, to take the race, racing uh, example forward, there are three basic things that one needs in a race. You need a track, you need a vehicle, and you need a driver. So how does that apply to this business? The vehicle I liken to our business formats. Whether you look at it as a bike or a car, in our case, a vehicle would be the format that we are applying. Are we taking our QSR from point A to point B, or is it a kiosk supported by a central kitchen, which is either our own or outsourced? Or is it a fine dining restaurant? So the vehicle for me represents a, a, a format, the food and beverage format that we have. The drivers, I find, are very, very interesting in our case, in our business uh, case. There are two aspects to this driver. One is uh, our large and hungry dynamic target audience. India is the ultimate dynamic target audience. That's one hell of a driver. And the second is our own desire as food and beverage guys to serve this target market and to also make some money. Let's not just tell ourselves that we only want to serve. Let's admit we want to make money, and money is a motivator, money is a driver, and also our passion to drive. So these two aspects within us as food and beverage and within the market, you club that together, and that's quite a terrific combination to potentially drive this industry and actually achieve our objective of going on this expressway and really having spectacular growth. And the third aspect is our, uh, we, we spoke about the drivers, we spoke about the vehicles, and now we speak about the track. And that's a bit of a downer, I must confess, because the track I see as our infrastructure. I don't mean infrastructure as a nation, like roads and drains and stuff like that. I mean infrastructure as government policy, whether that government policy is on real estate and having no regulation, so we have problems in real estate, or whether we see our policy as licensing, which is another big problem in our industry, and manpower is another big problem. And all of us keep complaining that these are the problems. I confess we have to admit and face the fact that these are indeed our problems, but if we let that, that take us down, we really can't move forward at all. So what I feel for today, on this one particular point of the track, I'm recommending just one thing. As individuals, in my view, we can do very little to influence how real estate is working for us, how manpower is working for us, how licensing is working for us, but what we can do on this front, in my view, is support forums, trade bodies, federations, hotels, restaurants, support them because they can represent us better. And this is going to take a long time. It's clearly not going to happen overnight. So that's something which even if you and I sit 24 hours a day in front of the government doors and say, this is what we want in licensing and this is why, it's not going to happen overnight, let's accept that. Let's not cry about that. But let's also do something to the extent that we can and leave that on the back burner, that'll happen. But for today, I'd like to focus on what we can do that is in our control. 
So those were some of the attitudes in terms of having an attitude of racing to start with. And I'd like to move now to the focus areas uh, before we go on to uh, q and I'd like to speak about what I feel the focus area should be and why. Now, the first thing is when, uh, when I have uh, friends who are restorators, who have individual restaurants, some of which are very successful, they say, do you think I should go in for a joint venture? Or should I be going in for a franchise? Or then should I just grow myself organically? You know, I have the money, I can just grow myself. What should I do? And I say the, the starting point in terms of thought should be asking yourself many things internally first. Because unless you internalize a couple of things, you will not point true north in every decision along the journey. So first, you need to internalize some things. Because very often, for example, if I want to grow my single restaurant, I will tell someone, you know, it's not just for the money. It's for the love of it. I need to accept internally it is also for the money. It's another thing what I'm posturing, and it's, it's another thing uh, what I really want. But an example of a mistake in that would be if I have decided internally that I have a location here in one part of the city, I want a location in another part of the city, and in that part of the city is so important for me to be present that even though I want to make money, I will allow myself to bleed or I will allow myself to make very little money there. I want presence there. So I will allow that to happen. I will take that decision consciously. But in another market, I will say I'm not really interested in that market. If I get a rental and if I get some good stuff happening there, then only I will commit. If I don't make money, I'm not going to go in that market at all. If I've not thought through this internally, and I keep kidding myself and keep kidding everyone else, I will not take honest decisions in those areas. So the first thing is asking yourself, what motivates you to grow? In which areas money would be the driving force, in which areas presence or passion may be the driving force, to what extent you can afford to do various things. That's the first thing. In fact, uh, when, I, when I speak to professionals or entrepreneurs trying to probe their mind on this, something very interesting comes up. And, and some of you, I think, will identify with this. I ask them, you have one restaurant now, or you have five restaurants now, how do you spend your time every day from morning to evening? Just give me a typical uh, schedule. What do you do from morning to evening every day? Whether you have one restaurant or 10 restaurants, what do you do? And 99% of the time, they give me a checklist which looks like the checklist an operations head of their business should have. And I immediately ask them, uh, Atul, this looks like a checklist your operations manager should be having. Why are you as an owner doing all this stuff? And he says, come on, Ravi, you know this business. There are so many things to do. Who's going to do it? I have to do it. I can't afford a multi-unit manager, one of those high-end professionals and things like that. I can't afford that. So I remember my own days as an entrepreneur when I spoke these exact same words. And that was my mistake. I believed when I ran my catering business, Sun Catering, many years ago, 1993, I thought that I would be the best representative of my business in the marketplace. I would be the best guy to market my own business. Who else can know the business better than me? So I have to go out into the market and market it. Anyway, I can't afford a marketing professional. Justified it. I can't afford it. And later I discovered that 
had I had the wisdom to take a second risk. What do I mean by a second risk? The first risk I took in business when I punted that money in putting my business together and I reached a certain level. I should have recognized that now it is time to invest again. Okay, I can't afford it. I couldn't afford to do my business, but I still took that risk and put down that money. Now it's time to take that risk again and put down that money for this guy because I need to work on the business, not in the business. I have learned over so many years how to work in the business. If there's an emergency, I can work in the business. There is no problem. But if I don't work on the business, this business will never grow. So actually understanding that and implementing that are two completely different things. You have to have not just the wisdom, because I'm sure all of you know this. You have to have the discipline. And you have to take that risk again to put down that money on someone who will allow you to look at the big picture, to progress your business forward. That's what you need to do. Because you would be wasted as a resource if you are working in the business. Your time would be much better spent if you worked on the business. And that is why there is wisdom in exercising that discipline. So uh, that's, the, that's the first thing. The next uh, part is something which we all know, which is very, very important. And that is, in order to grow, you need time, you need effort, and you need money. We all know that. You need expertise as well, of course. We all know that. And this is something which, again, one has to have the discipline. You have to have a talk with yourself. And this is very, very important. Because if you think through this aspect carefully, you will automatically come to the conclusion whether it is right for you to get into a JV or a franchise or grow organically yourself. The day you ask yourself a question and introspect honestly over several days, weeks, or months that it takes and come up with the answer of, do I have, a, have the time as an individual entrepreneur to put in towards this growth? Or do I have other commitments? Do I have the energy or the bandwidth? <clears throat> do I have the expertise? And do I have the money? And there are some times you may have the money, but you may deliberately choose to introduce someone into your business who can share your risk, give their time, bring some fresh thought into the business. Instead of saying, no, I want to have full controlling share. Maybe you even say, I will give up to 49% and retain that 51% controlling share in my business so I can still take the decisions and direct the business in the manner that I would like to, but I still need someone else. Recognize that, if that is necessary. And there is an aspect in this that there are some people who are called creators, and there are some people who are called developers or managers. There's this philosophy in management that the people who help you start a business, or if you are an entrepreneur who starts a business, you may not be the right person to grow your business. That's a different mindset. Because in a startup, it is believed that one needs to be creative, one needs to be innovative, one needs to focus on you know, tightening your resources. And that's completely different from maintaining something, a daily routine, status quo. In fact, one of the most famous examples I can think of is McDonald's. If some of you have read the story, uh, the McDonald's brothers started off McDonald's and it was a very successful single restaurant. 
and a lot of milkshakes used to be sold at those restaurants, at that restaurant, that first restaurant. And along came a man who was over 50 years old called Ray Kroc, who's known as the founder of McDonald's, but he didn't actually start it. He was a salesman of multi-mixers that helped make the milkshakes. And he walked in and said, what are these guys doing that they need so many multi-mixers? It's a great opportunity for me to sell my multi-mixers, but there has to be something more in this place. So he went to investigate. And when he investigated, he discovered that these guys are not only selling a whole lot of milkshakes, they're selling a whole lot of burgers and it's extremely popular. So I have to get involved in this business somehow. And he tried to find out, can I buy a stake in this business? Can I help out in this business in some way? And he slowly bought a stake and he slowly bought out the McDonald's brothers. And he was the guy who grew McDonald's to what we know as today. He was the guy who got people involved, franchisees involved. And he allowed them to grow and earn more money than the corporate McDonald's did initially to show them that you too can make money from this. He didn't just speak. He made sure that they earned money from it. So that's an example of the McDonald's brothers being the creators and Ray Kroc being the developer or the one who grew. So it's indeed a philosophy for you all to mull over that do you need someone else to help you run your place? And I'm not saying necessarily that in every example that someone who's created something cannot grow it or develop it. You can. In fact, many of you who've started your businesses may not have known about the business the day you started it. But along the way you learned. There's a saying that uh, the best way to learn is you first jump off the mountain and then you develop your wings. You learn to fly. Many of you have done that, I'm sure. And you can learn to fly even during growth. But ask yourself if that growth will be much slower. Will it be more painful? Will it be more expensive to grow that way? Is there a better way to grow? Ask yourself. And you will know what is right for you. No one can tell you that. People can only lead you in that direction. But you have to take those decisions. And that has to be in sync with what you, you need at the core, what your business requirements are. And about this affording of a, a manager, um, I, I recently, I, I worked some time back actually with a client who couldn't recognize that his restaurant manager was as talented as I saw it because the restaurant manager had been there for over a decade. And he said, no, this guy, you know, he is of this level only. He can't be a multi-unit manager. He can't be the guy who's relieving me and giving me that free time. He can't be that guy. I need somebody of a certain level. But I can't afford that guy. So you've gone and caught yourself into a trap. You've created that trap. Either you say, I'm going to put down that money and get that high-end, experienced, uh, multi-unit manager from some of the best international brands in the business, and I'm going to put down that money there. Or you say, I can't afford it. Let me submit to the fact that I am not able to recognize the talent that exists right in front of me. We have our concept in, in, uh, in India, ghar ki murgi dal barabar. So sometimes it's like that, where you have a good guy in front of you, but you don't recognize that you can actually develop him. He's not been the perfect guy when he started out as a, as a restaurant manager. You developed him. So now develop him to grow from a single unit manager to a multi-unit manager. Develop him, or then make the other choice and put down that money. So that's the core of your decisions. But there are a couple of things. There's one main point that I'd like to also uh, end off with, 
and that is in terms of thinking through as an investor. Now many of you or most of you I understand are entrepreneurs, not investors. But the reason it is important for you to think like an investor, take out your restorator hat for a moment and wear an investor hat. Even if you choose or you've already decided that you're not going to get an investor, even then, please think of how an investor thinks. And I'll tell you why. An investor has a couple of questions that they would ask you, a couple of aspects of your business that they want to study before they put down money on it. Just like you make an assessment when you put down money in uh, an investment like a property or uh, shares that you buy or any kind of investment, you evaluate that investment, you see what kind of return it's going to give you. You maybe check out something about the background of that uh, that investment, you check what the risks are. So you might think that you know your business because you've given birth to that business. You know your business inside out. Certainly you know your business inside out. You know the nuts and bolts of that business inside out. I completely agree. But have you ever looked at your business with the perspective of an investor? Look at it, even if you've decided that you're not going to look at it, you're not going to get an investor in. Look at it that way. And what are the things that an investor looks at? He'd look at the likelihood of your success, the success of your concept in the marketplace. They'd look at what your financials are, whether you, can, uh, you have the potential to scale up in many geographies. They'd look at whether you have some kind of a USP to stand out if they are imitators in the market. They'd look at the competency and capability of you and your team, whether you have that capability to take your business from where it's at to where you'd like it to be, and in how much time all of this is going to happen. So if you think along these lines very objectively, and be very firm with yourself. This is something you can do in private. Be very firm with yourself. Because internally it is eventually your attitude, your approach, your thought process which will give direction to your entire business. And that is what will make it spectacular and that is what will help save time. So to sum up what I've been saying, Look at internalizing your attitudes. Look at the focus areas that I spoke of. Look at what your drivers are, what kind of vehicle you have. Look at the problems on your track. Think through who are the people you need to associate with. Do you need to associate with a partner that you're going to bring in? Do you need to associate with an employee that you're going to bring in? Is that person going to come in for his time or his expertise or his money? And that will be the basis for your agreement with that person. And I believe in planning everything thoroughly, but as you know, despite planning, things can go wrong and they will. And then you just have to build your wings along the way as you have when you started your first business. So that's what I have to share with you for the moment and wish you the best for 2015 and hope you do have a spectacular growth and you do it very quickly. And uh, I thought I'd like to leave some amount of time if some of you have individual questions because that would make it more specific and more interactive. What I've tried to share with you now is on the premise that there are investors in this room, there are single entrepreneurs in this room having single standalone outlets, there are uh, already chain outlet entrepreneurs here, uh, people just of general interest, so I tried to give you a summary of what your focus areas and attitudes should be, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them.
Thank you. Thank you. Good uh, insight, Ravi. Thanks a lot. I'm sorry. Uh, could you please speak a little louder? Yeah. A good yes. insight in your talk. Uh, fantastic uh, in terms of coverage. I've got one question. You talked yes. about uh, you know working on the business uh, versus uh, working in the business. Yes. Uh, so can you elaborate sure. what you mean by that a uh, sure. little more? Sure. With some examples of where one should be spending time on as an yes. entrepreneur. Yeah, that might yes. help. Thank yes. you. Yes. Yes. Okay. Any business is made up of people, time, money, and all the resources that we know of. How you focus those resources is what will help you differentiate between working on the business and in the business. For example, if I say that I want to earn money when I'm not physically present in my business, how do I do that? I have people working for me in shifts doing that. So what I've done effectively is I've created a system which can run itself. The best question to ask yourself to answer that question is, can the business run in my absence? And if so, to what extent? When I ran my business, I wanted to be the marketing guy. There was a chef who I caught uh, flicking groceries for his home, fired him, I will cook, because I know how to do every aspect of the business. And that was the greatest mistake I made, because I thought, not just could I not afford these very high-end people, but I can do it myself, who better? But I wasted my time in investing it in the business. During the growth stage, that was still okay. But during the stabilization stage, uh, I mean, during the startup stage, that is still okay. But during the stabilization of, and growth stage, that is the worst thing that I could do. That is the worst focus that I could have, because once, when I fell ill, the business rocked. It was a big problem. Big problems in the business, because without me, the business couldn't function. I was the system, and that was my foolish mistake. So try to identify, when you invest your time in your business, even if you feel, this can't be done without me, or this can't be done, somebody else can do it, but they won't do it as well as me. Think again. Can you do something better and bigger to progress your business? Can you think of, okay, this is the next location I need to be. Let me visit that location. Let me understand that target audience. Let me go to that catchment area. Let me uh, study it. And then you will be investing your time on the right thing. Does it, does it answer uh, your question? I, I think it does. Basically, what you're saying is create a system where you're able to leverage uh, the resources which may be available to you yes. to enable growth to happen, where you're able to spend time effectively to look at that whole system and how that system is functioning on your business. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any other questions? Yeah, good, good morning, sir. This is Heyman from Tamiful Food Venture, Hyderabad. Uh, sorry, from? Tamiful Food Venture, Private sure. Limited, Hyderabad. Sir, right now I'm coming up with a food, business, food commerce business, which I am in uh, stealth mode. I'm going online next month. Okay. So the biggest problem, what we feel uh, when we are uh, recruiting chefs and all, that everyone has become a chef nowadays. Okay, so ours is a regional food business. So, regional food. Yes. Authentic regional. Yes. So, what we did, we are picking up the Maharaj, the yes. gathering guys from the small towns and villages. Yes. And we are training them. Okay. So, so the biggest uh, the, the issue with them is they are used to work on the uh, utensils and all, which they are not familiar with the commercialized kitchen. Yes. So, how to overcome this? I, have, I am putting a uh, strategic uh, training and all, but still they are not, because they 
her from 20 years they used to cook the what do you call the their way yes. in northern pots and the big handies and all yes can we do that with in even the commercial thing uh, yeah uh, so what you what just to understand your question correctly what you're saying is that you've hired people who know their business uh, in terms of food production but they're not able to produce it in the manner that you would like them to, in a clean, sophisticated manner that you would right. like them to, right. right? Okay. I think firstly, I'd like to compliment you on taking such a decision. Instead of crying about it and saying that chefs are too expensive, these educated guys, because then you would have another problem today, and that is how to deal with egos. Right. So I think you've chosen the better path, in my view, and many people in the industry are not yet savvy to this path. I think this is the better path today because you've, in, in one sense, yes, you've solved one problem but created another, but I would still choose the route that you've chosen. I think that the, the only thing that I can say for this, and I've, I've worked with such people myself, uh, where there is a Maharaj culture, okay? And uh, I'm going to the Gaon for 30 days, and after 40 days, the guy still not come back and you can't schedule your stuff. You can't schedule your time. Or he has no understanding of cleanliness. Uh, you have to teach them that. And the, the best way that people will do it is you have to use a stick and you have to use a carrot. The best carrot is money and the best stick indirectly is also money. You have to find legal ways to use that stick, okay? Because I don't want to be quoted on something like this, but I'm just saying you have to find legal ways to use that stick. But that's the best way you can train anyone for anything. I had a, rest uh, a restorator tell me once that, you know, my clients are some of the most sophisticated industrialists in our country. But this uh, guy who is our, you know, main executive, he doesn't have that sophistication. And Again, he could not see what I saw in that man. That man had a certain gentleness and grace, but he understood what sophisticated people required. One doesn't need to be sophisticated oneself to cater to a sophisticated person. So I took them through an exercise in, 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 uh, you know, to, to that, uh, in that similar case to train people on attitudes, took them through an exercise through an external company uh, in terms of training people on uh, food safety. And slowly awareness happens. You, the only way to do it is patience coupled with the stick and carrot. Because if you only have patience, nothing will go in. No, sir. Uh, my, my question is like this. I am training them. That is fine. Can't we come up with, uh, do, do we have resources where we can develop the kitchen equipment in their own way, like modern thing and all, but the way, is there any people oh. available and sources available? You mean fabricate the equipment that way? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, see, what you have to do is give people a design. And yeah. those designs may not exi exist in the market. That exists in India or we have to go to China or somewhere else? No, no, no. You have to get it fabricated. So you'll have equipment fabricators. You have to get hold of an equipment fabricator. But they take, like, uh, right now I have designed something yes. for a regional snack. Yes. I've given to him, there, there is a lot of pause. I went to China, there they, they, they are able to catch it. See, I'll that. tell you, I, I'll, I'll tell you. For example, you may find some things ready-made. For example, I remember when I was doing research on uh, chapatis and parathas here, uh, I found that the machines available in the Indian market weren't uh, exciting. Uh, and there were some things in uh, Thailand, uh, and, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, those kind of places, Malaysia, which had paratha, slightly different from us, right. but very similar. And they had automated stuff, uh, which was uh, rather good. Sir, and I don't want Indian to automate the stuff. I want a human touch. Where is the integration? Do you yes. have, do you, is no, there, there is any no, resource there is available? No, uh, there is no, uh, no sort of one vendor that you can go to. You have to develop it. Okay. You have to develop that, and that will mean time and expense, which means that you try something, it may not work. Okay. Then again, it's like an R&D okay. project. A simple thing like at the Olive Bar and Kitchen, uh, when, when I worked there, I was helping design uh, a, a, little, uh, 
a little uh, grill on which you can keep plates so that you can hold it together like this. Now, something like this exists internationally, but in those days, uh, when I helped start Olive, nothing like that existed. So I had to go to a fabricator and create, first draw out a shape for him. He gave me the first version. Then I said, no, I want this much gauge. I said, no, I want this polish. Then I said, no, this finish is not good. And we had many stages of it. And that was just one example. You have, there's so many things which one develops over one's so lifetime. So we have to develop our r and There is no people doing this. Yeah, so, so for example, uh, there again, I don't know if you've visited Olive, but there again, there is a, a sizzler board with a plate inside it, a glass plate inside it. And, and there's a rod which hangs up with a hook like this. And there's a, there's a, uh, there's a skewer hanging from that with the tandoori items there. And that's the drip plate. That's something which looks elegant in a certain place like that. And again, to develop that took me a lot of time and research and effort. Nothing was ready-made. A lot of mistakes happen at the expense of time and money. So there's nothing that you can do about that. But it's, I think it's a fantastic thing that you're trying to do. Thank you, sir. Hey, uh, my name is Saurabh. And uh, my question is, the, the trust factor in human resource uh, seems to be at least my biggest concern, if, you, if the person can. Uh, could you speak a little louder, please? Sure. I'm, I'm talking about um, how the trust factor in yes. human resource seems to be at least my, one of the biggest concerns. And yes. you know, if the person will do justice to the business that I'm running and, and stuff. So how did you cope with it? As in, did you take a blind leap or, uh, you know, uh, or did you, you know, were you very cautious uh, how you went about it? What was your approach uh, with the human resource and the trust? Uh, so I have found that uh, Honesty has been the best policy for me. And uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, there was a restaurant that I worked with uh, where uh, we were looking for a restaurant manager. And uh, the promoter had worked with someone in the past and told me that this guy is good. But I threw him out in my last restaurant because he was caught flicking money. I said, why are you telling me this if you say he's caught flicking money? That's the end of it. If it's an integrity issue, uh, I mean, you know, where's the question of taking it forward? So then when I probed further, I realized that he meant he was not caught. He was suspected. So I said, you took a decision to throw him out because he was suspected of that. Okay. And now you feel his work is good, so you want to take him back. Okay. He said, Ravi, just meet the guy. He's good. I said, okay. I went and met this guy and I said, Joseph, uh, Mr. So-and-so has said uh, that the reason he threw you out was because you were flicking money. Is that true? And he told me his side of the story. And uh, we had a great relationship. Uh, that man went on to work even after I stopped continuing with Olive, went on to work with Olive and uh, worked there for a long, long time. And uh, told me many years later that I will never forget that you started off our relationship on that note because then I had no choice but to give you my all because we started on a clean slate. And what I find is I've, I've even uh, worked with people who I have no control over as a boss. Uh, there was this uh, brand called uh, Sir Ratan Tata Institute. And, uh, I like the food there, and I volunteered my time for free. Uh, they have a union, and they have some trustees, and some major trust issues between the trustees and the union. And I tried to do the best that I could. Uh, I believe I was able to succeed to some extent. Uh, again, with honesty, uh, as politely as I can, uh, but as brutally as it needed to be. Because sometimes we can't see things about ourselves. We are all vulnerable and we are all, uh, you know, we all going to make mistakes. And, and everybody comes in with an agenda. So there might be people who come in with an agenda or say there was this guy who uh, used to drink a lot of liquor. And uh, he was thrown out from his previous job because I called up his ex-employer. Uh, and the reason he was thrown out from that is because of his liquor. And I confronted him and I told him, look, this is the problem. If you're going to do this here, I can't hire you. So uh, I said, you do what you want outside. Uh, and, and then he started coming in with red eyes, but he was not drinking on, on the premises. And I said, look, 
as long as it doesn't affect your work, I don't care if you're sloshed through the night, but you have to be alert in all your senses here because I can't afford you to mess up. You'll either hurt yourself or you'll hurt somebody or you know, you'll damage the reputation of the company. I can't afford that. So I think leveling with a person, regardless of their level, whether he's a utility worker or a massive investor, uh, I think uh, honesty is, a, is the biggest leveler. Uh, you can you know, completely bring down someone exactly where you want them with complete honesty. And if you find that that's, that's not enough, then I think don't work with that person. Uh, does that help? It does. Thank you. Uh, hi. Hi. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Uh, you mentioned about growth and stability period. Uh, how do you growth identify and? Then the stability period of the, of the yes. brand, right? Yes. How do you identify uh, when the growth period ends and when the stability period starts? How do you okay. identify that? That's one. Okay. The other one is when is the right time for a single uh, single outlet to expand? When, when, okay. How do you identify that? Okay. In, in my view, uh, the right time to say that uh, things are stable is when uh, you feel that the number of mistakes happening routinely in your company are not very, very high. Even the best organization in the world will continue making mistakes. But if you feel that your mistakes are going to be multiplied in your new locations and that is going to come at the cost of time and money, then you are not ready to grow. You can't even call yourself being stabilized. Stabilizing is when you've reached a stage where uh, your mistakes are few enough, they are there, but they are few enough uh, that you need to, uh, uh, you can say that I can afford to make this level of mistakes in my other locations. So I think uh, broadly that is the time. And, and we, can, we can continue this outside because I see a lot of people I think coming in for the next uh, discussion. So uh, I mean I'm happy to spend some time with any of you outside if you'd like to, but I think we must allow the next session to continue. So thanks uh, very much all of you. And if you'd like to drop in your cards, uh, those of you who've attended the session, I promise I won't send you any mails or spam you. I'd just like to understand the profile of people that I've spoken with today. No compulsion, only if you'd like to. Thanks very much.